The canvas of God's love is broad. But as Christians exercise the love of God in the world, one common thread holds it all together. The Christian story speaks of a mystery that lies deep in the soul of every human being. In the beginning, God in all his power and creativity reached down to craft a world that reflects his glory. By his word, he spoke the planets into existence. But with his hands and his breath, he sculpted men and women unlike anything else. The scriptures tell us that human beings were God's masterwork, and he wrote his signature, set his imprint on the human soul. Humans are created in the Imago Dei, the image of God. Good morning, everyone. So glad to be with you again in your home, and uh, thank you for taking time to watch our home video worship services that we've been providing. I'm glad that we can connect this way. I miss seeing your face. I am praying for you, and I'm glad that we can connect this way. Uh, we had a tremendous Easter celebration last weekend, and uh, I, I pray that your time at home and your worship time was meaningful for you and your family. I know it was for us as we celebrated our Lord's resurrection and, uh, and, and, and worshiped and prayed together. Um, I appreciate um, challenges in life that brings and stretches us and brings a renewal about who we are as a community of faith. I'm excited to see how the church is connecting uh, with, with people these days and, and how he's stretching us as well. So thank you for praying with us, standing with us, and uh, glad we could be together again this morning this way. I want to talk with you the next few moments in the next few weeks, if we could, together about being made in the image of God. There's a Latin term that describes that. It's, it's called the imago dei, and that is, uh, describes us being made in the image of God, the image of our Creator, and the image of His likeness. But what does it mean that we are made in His image? What does that really mean? Uh, we seem to have a lot of imperfections uh, as far as how we are made as humans. We, in our state now, our fallen humanity, our fallen state, we have a lot of imperfections. And so how, how do we uh, resemble God in that? How, how are we made in His image as the scriptures tell us? Well, it's my prayer that as we unpack uh, these thoughts over the next few weeks that we'll come to gain a clearer understanding of what it means to be made in the image of God. My wife, Mary Alice, is from a small rural community in, in Indiana called Hazleton, and um, there, there's a sharp turn when you go down Main Street, right past my father-in-law's house, there's a sharp turn to the right, like if you're heading that direction, I guess it would be the left if you're coming from the other direction, uh, but it's a really sharp turn, and, and there's a lot of uh, truck traffic, a lot of semis take this highway from Hazleton to Petersburg and the back rural routes uh, off of Highway 41. And so to make that, that jog over to smaller communities over that way, these semi-trucks will make this sharp turn uh, at this corner in the middle of town. And so what my brother-in-law has done, uh, Chuck, um, he's put a, a mirror on the corner on a telephone pole uh, for the truckers to be able to look into the mirror to see if there's any oncoming traffic around the corner uh, of the sharp turn. There's a building right there on the corner, an old church building. Um, and so it's hard to see if anybody's coming or uh, from the other direction. So there's a mirror there that when the trucker looks into that mirror or anybody is passing by or even I've been walking the dog out past that area and, and looked at the mirror to see if any trucks were coming around that corner. Uh, so, but when we look into that mirror, as you look into a mirror every morning, there is an image reflected back to you. And so when we talk about the image of God and being made in the likeness of God, it's it's not that we are that we look like God in the sense that because we are in, in, in an imperfect state we are we are we are fall, what Paul says it best in Romans he tells us that we have all fallen short of the glory of God and and so we are in a fallen state humanity is in a broken fallen state and so for us to say that we are made in His image how can our fallen state be made in the image of Christ well it, when we look into that mirror we reflect an image back at us. Um, we, we look into it and we see the reflection of however it's, it's facing. That mirror on the corner of that street is facing towards the upper part of that road. And so when I look at the mirror, I don't necessarily see myself, but I see the oncoming traffic. And that's the way it is with us as we live for Christ. Because of Jesus, we, we are being made in his likeness. Uh, and uh, we are made into uh, this process of sanctification, if you will, and this process of renewal. And so we are being made more like him. As we reflect 
him, we, as, we, as we bring love and joy and peace and, and happiness, as we bring the gospel, as we share that seed that I talked about last week, um, we are reflecting the image of God. We are reflecting his likeness. We, are, we, we see God reflecting on his creation, and we are in return reflecting his image each time we care for his creation, displaying his qualities. We are not reflecting our hu humanness, but rather we are reflecting his greatness. We are reflecting his, his, his presence. We are reflecting uh, his image, and so we are reflecting his image. We are reflecting who he is as likeness. For example, as we reflect the, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, it tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is joy, peace, patience, kindness, long-suffering. Uh, those qualities, as we reflect those qualities, we are reflecting the character of God. We're reflecting His characteristics. So as we do that, we are reflecting His image. This reminds me of something that happened right after the resurrection of Christ. And it's found in, the, in Luke's Gospel in chapter 24. And you can turn there with me, if you will, in verses 13 through 36. And we see this picture of two disciples of Christ uh, walking from Jerusalem, uh, away from Jerusalem on this road to Emmaus. Now, if you, if you look at history of Emmaus, it, it could have been uh, uh, an area called Amwas, uh, which was about um, 7 to 14 miles. An older account would say it's 14 miles from Jerusalem, Jerusalem but the, the biblical account here would say 7 miles. Anyway, the point is, that it was within a day's walk so the disciples could walk to Emmaus and back. Uh, if it was 28 miles, it would be a little different story, wouldn't it? But, but here we see these disciples walking along. And a, a scholar recently reported that as he took this same path that these disciples walked on, the road to Emmaus, um, it, it, when you walk along this path uh, in the day's walk there and back to Jerusalem, you can see portrayed really the whole life of Christ and the areas that, and of the events of, of the scriptures that we, that we read about in the life of Jesus and, and uh, his life and, and death and resurrection. And so you can walk along this road and see the story of Christ. And this is an important point that I want you to connect the, dot, the dots here as we tell the story here, as we read the story together in, in the book of Luke. It's important to understand. And these two disciples that, that one is named, one is not, um, but it's interesting uh, to think about who these characters are, and sometimes we kind of overlook this, but it's very important in the story uh, to understand the, the players and, and, the, and the characters in the story. Here we see uh, one named, it's, it's Cleopas, and Cleopas is married to uh, a woman by the name of Mary. Now, at the crucifixion scene, you see three Marys. You see Mary, the mother of Christ, and you see Mary Magdalene, and you also see another Mary. Now, you wouldn't think that Mary, the mother of Christ, would have a sister named Mary as well. And also, when your sister, when your brother or sister gets married, uh, you don't necessarily call that sister, when your brother gets married, you don't necessarily call that sister a sister-in-law of his wife. Now you call him or her one of your sisters. That's, you call her sister. And so that's why we see the name sister uh, Mary here. But it, we, we want to look at this picture and understand who Cleopas was. We would see Cleopas as, maybe this was a husband and wife walking along from Jerusalem to Emmaus. They're walking along and they're discussing uh, and talking about the, the recent events of Christ's death. Now, this is a very important matter to them. And they're downtrodden, as the word describes. They're, they, they seem like something's wrong as they walk along and talking and dialogue, dialoguing about this. It's because it, it's not only um, family, Jesus is, is a nephew, uh, but, but it's also their Messiah. It's, 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 their, it's the one that they follow. He, they are disciples of Jesus. So it's very dear to their hearts, the situation. And I love what the story tells us as it unfolds. It says, as they were walking and talking about the events of the, of the recent days of, of Christ's uh, death, um, that, that Jesus comes alongside of them. He, he just happens to appear there. And, and it's interesting also that he initiates the conversation with them. He just kind of walks into their scene, uh, to, the, to the picture here, and begins to talk. And he asks them the question, why are you so downcast? You know, they, they, were, they were troubled by the news of what had happened. And, and then they were surprised by this stranger that walked alongside of them. And, and they said, well, where have you been? Have you, have you not heard of the events of these last few days about, um, about Jesus and about um, his death and his crucifixion? Have you not heard about this? 
If Jesus were alive today, he would be asking us questions. In Jewish culture and tradition, they would ask questions, and so they understood the asking of questions. And Jesus came alongside of them. He appeared, and he asked, why are you so, so downcast? Now understand something here. This was the biggest event that had happened in history, uh, certainly in their lives. And, um, and Cleopas was asking him, he said, basically, uh, where were you? Where have you been when all this has happened? He still doesn't recognize who Christ is. You see, I want you to understand also that God does not keep us and prevent us from recognizing God. He, he, he beckons for us. He is a jealous God. He wants us to come to him. He wants us to see him. Uh, but, but God did not keep them from knowing him, but their eyes prevented them from being able to understand who he was, to see him. You see, we have things that prevent us seeing God all around us in our lives. We, we allow the noise of, the life, of our lives. We allow the busyness of our lives. We allow... Um, things in our lives to crowd out the presence of God when, when all, all it takes is for us to call on his name and he's right with us. The Bible says that he will never leave us nor forsake us. And so God is with us. He is Emmanuel, but we have a way and a tendency to, to crowd him out and not recognize him and not see him for who he is. So Cleopas asked him, he says, where have you been? And Jesus' response, I love the way he, he responded to Cleopas when Cle Cleopas uh, asked this question, where have you been? This is big, the biggest event that's happened around here in our lives, and you don't know the events of, of the time, what's going on. And Jesus says um, to Cleopas, he says, what thing? Oh, that thing. Almost as if to, as if to say, yeah, I know about that, and, and, but, but this is the more important thing now. He basically is saying, Yes, that event was needed and necessary, but what's more necessary now is that you know me and that you understand me. And I, I love that, that his reaction in that. Jesus is, is, is saying, um, oh, oh, that. Well, yeah, that was important, but this is more important now. You see, I'm so thankful that our story doesn't end in the grave. Jesus' story didn't end in the grave. His story is about a resurrection, and we celebrated that this past Sunday. Your story is about a resurrection that you can have in knowing who God is, your creator, identifying him, re responding to him, recognizing God's presence, recognizing who he is, his, his likeness, and responding to that and letting, allowing him to come into your life and so that you can recognize who he is. And so he wants to get them to come to an understanding of who he is. That's really the point of the, of the story here. He's saying, what thing? Oh, that, that thing. But, but listen, now this is really what's important here, you and I, to know who I really am. This is the, the most important part of this conversation, that Jesus, Jesus loves conversation. Uh, preaching means to have a conversation. He, and so here we see, we, we, we see that Jesus is wanting to tell the story uh, to, in front of them. He's wanting to tell them the whole story. Um, the, the beautiful part about this is that as Jesus is walking along with these two disciples, Cleopas and, and Mary, he's able to describe the events of his own life, and they don't even know it. He's telling his own story, his own narrative, as they're walking along to this road Emmaus, to Emmaus, and he's telling his own life story, and they don't even recognize that, that it's Christ telling them about his own life. The beautiful part of the story is that Jesus is telling his own story as they're walking along, his own life story. It's an incredible moment as he's having a, this conversation and telling the story right in front of Cleopas and Mary. And so they, they, they're walking along this road and they, and they return uh, to their home. Cleopas and Mary are getting close to home. And the scripture tells us in the story that Jesus begins, he just c continues to walk as if he was, he's going to continue ahead and continue on. And, but Cleopas and Mary want to invite him to come and share a meal with them in their home. That was customary to do that, but it's also customary on the receiving end to not receive the first invitation. And so we see it in the scripture where Cleopas is kind of adamant about, no, stay with us. We really want you to come into our house. Now, it's interesting when they get into the house, they still don't recognize who Christ was or who Christ is. And so they're at the table. They're getting things ready. Now, when, when my wife and I or my family are invited to someone's home for dinner, you know, it's customary to usually... Um, allow the host uh, to pray or bless the food and as they're serving and as they're telling you, giving you directions where to sit or you know, how, how to go about how we're going to come together and, and share the meal together. And as a pastor, I, I'm, it's, it's, um, I'm 
usually anticipate someone asking me to pray over the meal, which I love doing that and have the opportunity to bless that home, bless that family. But I usually wait because it's their home, and as the head of the house, it's customary that the head of the house would bless the food. So here we have a picture of Jesus. He's sitting down at the table with Cleopas and Mary. I love this. And, and, and I believe that Cleopas is getting kind of a hint about there's something different about this man. Uh, I've felt something for a little while now, and I believe Mary is sensing the same thing. And, and, and instead of taking the initiative to take the bread and break the bread, the, the scripture tells us, the story unfolds, that Jesus himself uh, takes the bread and he breaks the bread and he begins to share it with Cleopas and Mary. Very uncustomary, very uh, non-traditional in that setting where the man would usually take the lead on that. But here we see Jesus takes over the room. He takes over the table and he begins to share and break bread with Cleopas and Mary. And I love what the scripture unfolds here. The story unfolds to us and it, it shares with us that in that moment, there was, a, there was a realization, a revelation, or it's like their eyes were opened and they realized who this was. It wasn't so much in his voice. It wasn't so much in his appearance because they did, certainly didn't recognize him or, or hear his voice as they traveled and you know, walked together. They didn't recognize who he was. But in that moment when he broke the bread, his mannerisms, his, his countenance, his, just who he was, and the authority that he had in that moment that they remembered is what they did. They remember sharing meals with Jesus. They remember sitting down at the table with Jesus and his mannerisms, his, the way he carried himself, the way that he broke the bread all re reminded them of, of the Jesus that they once knew. So the question I ask when I read the story is, when was the moment they recognized that it was Jesus? And the beautiful thing about the story is they recognized him when he was at the table. That's when they knew that there was something about this. That I knew it all along. This is Jesus. This is, this is our Messiah. This is our Savior. This is our nephew. This is the one that we've loved and followed. And he's sitting with, he walked with us. How did we not know? How did, our, how did we not know as our hearts burned within us? They were, they were opened to see who he was. They recognized the presence of God was in their kitchen. It was right there in their own home. When he takes the bread, he breaks it, he blesses it, and, and, and they see his wounds. You see, uh, it was customary in first century clothing that they would be covered uh, from uh, their arms down to their hands, and all their, their legs to their feet. And so when he reached for the bread and began to break the bread, it revealed his wounds. And now the wounds are not scars. These wounds have not healed over. A scar would be healed over. It would be uh, in the process of healing. But when the Bible uh, depicts that this was wounds, it shares that this was wounds, that these wounds are possibly still bleeding. They're, they're, they're open wounds. They're real wounds. And so you can imagine as he, as he stands uh, and takes the bread and, and, his, and his, his garments are kind of pulled back over his back his, from his arm from reaching, they see these, these wounds on him and they recognize that this is Jesus. They recognize the wounds. They see his wounds. And that's what I love about our Lord is that he wants to show us his love for us so much that he's not afraid to show his wounds. He's not afraid to be transparent with us. Um, I love that, that he reveals himself to us totally and fully. And uh, I'm perplexed when I read the story because Cleopas and Mary should have known who this was, but they didn't recognize him until they saw his wounds. Spurgeon would share out of Luke 24, he, he would read this, this passage of scripture about the story. He said that he shooed them his hands and his feet. And then Spurgeon proposed the question, of what use was the exhibition of those wounds to the disciples? And he said, behold my hands and feet, that it is I myself. It was, established, it was to establish his identity, Spurgeon would say, that he was the very same Jesus whom they had followed and whom they had deserted and whom they had beheld afar off when he was, he was crucified and slain and whom they had carried to the tomb in the gloom of the evening. It was the very same Christ who was now before them and they might know it for there was the seal of his suffering upon him. And then he asked the question, what does Christ mean by showing to us his hands and feet? It is the meaning that his suffering was absolutely necessary. 
He, he, he revealed his wounds because he wanted, them to, he wanted Cleopas and Mary to know that I had to go through this for you to know the, the Father. I had to go through this for, 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 for fallen humanity to, to be able to be reclaimed, to be redeemed, to be regenerated, to be renewed in God's love and care. Spurgeon ends his message with this. He says, Thy wounds, O Jesus, thy, thy wounds, these are my refuge and my trouble. O sinner, may you be helped to believe in his wounds. They cannot fail. Christ's wounds must heal those that put their trust in him. Thank you, Reverend Spurgeon, for speaking that word to us. What does Jesus do when they recognize him? It's an interesting part of the story, isn't it? The scripture basically says he disappears. He vanishes. He leaves that moment with Cleopas and Mary, and he, and he is no longer in the picture. He, he leaves that moment. He said to Mary earlier, don't cling to me, is what he was saying. He, he leaves them up because he, he doesn't want them to cling to him in that. He wants them to know who he is. Uh, but why does he do this? He does not want them to be, get attached to him because he is, he is reassigning his presence in a whole new way. His Holy Spirit, the ultimate in distribution. Um, the Spirit brings Christ to life in every one of us. And uh, if, if Jesus was here, how long would you stand in line to, to see Jesus, to, to be able to talk with him? I imagine many of us would, would it, as long as it takes, to be with Christ. But, but today, we don't have to do that. We, can, we all can have an immediate access to the Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ. We all can walk. He, he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus is always with us. But the problem is we don't recognize his presence. We, 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 we push things, we push him out by, by allowing other things into our lives. But I'm so thankful that he reassigned how he would live in each one of us by his Holy Spirit. He has sealed that, he has sealed us in his right, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he has sealed us in relationship with the Father through his blood. So my question to you in these closing moments is that can you recognize the presence of God? Can you recognize his likeness? You see, the first step and then the key to understanding being made in the image of God, what that means, to gain clarity on what that means to be made in the image of God, the imago dei, is to understand and recognize the presence of God. You can't understand what it means, means to be made in his image unless you understand the presence of God and unless you recognize the presence of God. People say that my son Logan and I look alike. And I take it as a great compliment because I think he's a pretty sharp young man. Uh, he's six foot four, very handsome. Uh, he takes after his disp disposition after his mom. He takes after me on his good looks. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. You know I'm kidding. But I, we, I've been mistaken as, as being brothers in stores before, and I went around and hugged the clerk because I, I'll take that any day. Uh, but very proud of my son. But people say that when they, they see him, they see a reflection of me. Or when they hear his voice, uh, it almost sounds like I'm, I'm talking. And that's a great compliment to me. Um, you see, Logan is made in my likeness. Uh, he is he's, he's, he's my son. We have two other kids, my wife and I, Mary Alice. We, uh, you know, Mary, Megan and, and, and Madison. And, and they all have uh, different personalities. Uh, but they all have the likeness of their mom and dad. And you with children, you, your grandchildren, you, you see a little bit of, of, of family, you see a little bit of yourself, you, you see a little bit of your daughter or your son and your grandkids. Uh, you see that we are, they were made in our likeness. And, and so when God created you and I, he placed within us his DNA. You have a God DNA in you. Isn't that a beautiful thing? You say, but I, who am I? I'm, 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 I'm undone. I'm unrighteous. I'm, I'm imperfect. I've really made a mess of things. Uh, how can I have a holy God, a creator God, have his DNA in me? Uh, but the fact of the matter is, you are his creation. You are his child. You, he made you in his own image. The problem with, uh, with what we have today is that we are in a fallen state. Uh, because of sin and because of disobedience, we have a separation, this great chasm uh, between God and man. And so what, what we have is, is a fallen humanity around us. We have a, a troubled world. You know, uh, I'm reminded of Psalm 23. It says, that, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thy rod and thy staff. They are with me. They comfort me. 
And what that's saying is we, we are walking through a fallen humanity, a sin-filled world. And the only way we can recognize the image of Christ, the image of God in us, is that we come to understand or recognize who God is, recognize his presence. And so I have good news for you today, and I want you to be encouraged. Because you have that God DNA in you, he can reconcile you to himself. And that's why we celebrate Easter, because of Jesus' resurrection, we can be renewed, we can be reconciled, we can be redeemed by the blood of the perfect lamb, Jesus. Maybe you're at a place in life where you've contemplated the things of God, especially during this season that we're in with this dilemma that we're facing now as a, as a nation, as a world. And we're praying that, that God will continue to bring healing to our land. But we also have been at a place of, uh, I believe, of great confusion for many people, of fear and anxiety. But maybe you're at a place where you've thought a little bit more about where God is. Maybe you've been walking on that road, kind of like Cleopas and Mary on that road to Emmaus, and and, um, and you didn't recognize God was with you right then in that moment. You don't recognize God now, but somehow you've connected with us in this video and, and you're hearing my voice and you're hearing God's word and you're listening and this Holy Spirit that Jesus talked about uh, here with, with Cleopas and Mary, that he, he disappeared. He didn't necessarily talk about that, but he disappeared because he wanted them to, to understand that he's, he's distributing, distributing his presence to everyone through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's quickening your heart now and saying that God wants to get to know who you are. He wants to reconcile you to himself. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to lead you in a prayer, but you have to make the prayer yourself of your, of, your, of your own heart, own heart matter. I can pray with you, but I can't pray for you. But I want you to pray in, in this way and, and, and invite the creator, your God, the creator God who made you, who placed his DNA in you, to reconcile you to himself and come home to him again. Would you, would you consider doing that today? Just make him first in your life and give your heart to Christ right now. You want to pray along this way. You want to say, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I know that I cannot save myself. And I know, Jesus, that you died for my sins so that I might be made right with my creator. And I receive of your love right now. And I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins and be my Lord and be my Savior. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it with all your heart, the Bible says that you're saved. It says that all things are passed away and all things become new. And I want to say congratulations and welcome home. You are, you are a child of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I'm thankful to say that uh, if, if Jesus was walking alongside of you right now, you would be able to recognize him because of the Holy Spirit in you. You have God in you. And so when you leave this moment on this video, uh, the rest of your day or, or the rest of this week, I want you to know that God is with you. It's important that you get into the Word and know who he is. It's important that you get into a Bible-believing church and a place where the Holy Spirit is moving and operating in people's lives and you find a community who will surround you with love, the love of God. Then you will be able to see, as you come into understanding of who he is, you will gain clarity on what it means to be made in the imago dei, in the image of God. Listen, God loves you so much. He has so much for you to experience in this life, to know who he is, to know his image. But the beginning of, of understanding the image of God is to know, to recognize God, to recognize his presence. And you're on the beginning of a great new path to understanding the image of God. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for being with us today. Hey, and thank you also for uh, your continued uh, faithfulness in the tithe and the offering. I want to thank our, our church family for continuing to, to support the church and, and help us to meet budget. Uh, that's a couple ways we've made that available to you. First of all, it's through our, our, our P.O. Box 12778 in Charleston, 29412, uh, or actually 29422. Uh, and also through Cash App, that's the, uh, the Coastal Harvest Cash App. Thank you again for connecting with us this way. I'm praying for you. Uh, if you need anything, please call on us, uh, email or text, and, uh, and we'll help you in any way that we can. We love you. Jesus loves you. Have a great day.
the heart.